Hey everyone, I'm Ben Norton of Multipolarista, and this is the Empire and Deep State series that I'm co-hosting with my friends Aaron Good, the historian and author of the book American Exception, Empire and the Deep State that this series is based on, and the producer of the American Exception podcast, Seamus McGinnis. This is a continuation of our series. Now, you don't need to watch or listen to this series in chronological order, but for people who are following along, this is part 15, and we're going through now the history of the Eisenhower administration in the United States and the history of the U.S. empire and deep state. And in the, at the end of part 14, the previous part, we discussed the infamous CIA coup in Iran in 1953 and the role of the Seven Sisters, these big oil corporations that dominated the global oil industry and how the US and British intelligence agencies conspired with these big oil corporations to remove Iran's first ever democratically elected prime minister from power, Mohammad Mossadegh, and installed a, a dictatorship of, under the monarchy, the Shah. So Iran is a classic case study, but today we're gonna to be talking about three other examples, Guatemala, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And uh, Aaron, Let's start today talking about the infamous CIA coup exactly one year after Operation Ajax, after the CIA coup in Iran, and that is Operation Success in Guatemala in 1954. And it's a similar situation, except you replace oil with agriculture and the United Fruit Company. And just as in Iran, you had a democratically elected prime minister who was not a communist, certainly not Mohammad Mossadegh but he was popular and he had social democratic reforms and he nationalized the oil in Iran. Similarly, a year later in Guatemala, you had Jacobo Arvens who nationalized United Front and was trying to do land redistribution, land reform, because of course Guatemala was colonized and as in many countries in Latin America that were colonized by the Europeans, they never really had significant land reform and land was controlled by these colonialist elites, many of whom were direct descendants of the European colonialists. But of course, for the United Fruit Company and U.S. corporations, land reform is completely anathema. This is basically equivalent to communism. And he was overthrown in a CIA coup. So talk about this next case study under the Eisenhower administration. After Iran, we have Guatemala. Right. You have this in 1953 and 1954, you have two notorious CIA operations that overthrow democratically elected leaders in the global south, you know, third world countries, you could call them as Sukarno did. Uh, and these really shaped the destiny of these countries for a long time. The Iranian one we've already talked about, and it's impacted, it, it drastically impacted the course of Iranian history. And in Guatemala, it's also uh, extremely brutal. And, uh, you can see here these the guys who are running the the, the show here. Uh, you have Eisenhower and the the Third World. Well, I can there's a map here, and I'll include this in the uh, in the in the show notes. But the Third World is basically the First World is the the West here. You can see it in this image in blue. It's the the capitalist countries, the the advanced capitalist countries that are aligned to the the U.S. and Britain, Western Europe, and so on. Uh, and the, uh, this map isn't like perfect, but this is like show, you know, detailing some U S interventions. The second world world is, um, the communist countries. And then the third world is the other ones, the other the countries that used to be basically the countries that were colonized by Europeans, the areas of the world that were colonized by Europeans and Sukarno, who we're going to talk about later, takes this up and says like, let's look at this as a group. And so and let's think of ourselves as not with the West and not with the communist world either. We're trying to set our own path and we believe we should all be able to do this. We're, we'll get more into this later. But opposed to this is are, are the people that are running the U.S. foreign policy. Uh, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, the Secretary of State and the CIA director, respectively. And um, they were both Wall Street lawyers and they ran the world according to their the interests of Wall Street. And that was what they deemed the national interest, more or less. And um, they they pretty much ran the world according to the designs laid out by Council on Foreign Relations War and Peace Studies Project. And Alan Dulles was one of the main people overseeing that. And this is how they were going to run the U.S. manage the U.S. Empire. 
So uh, my book goes into this. You can also look at uh, David Talbot's book, The Devil's Chessboard, for stuff on um, on Alan Dulles. Really brilliant book. And that this is really the the deep state is not means that not so much somebody like Eisenhower is really the person who's steering things. It's that he's fit into this structure and planning that's done by people like Alan Dulles, corporate power. Well, and of course, so, he comes from the military, which is a key a key institution in that apparatus. Eisenhower, yes, for sure. So in the, in the Guatemala case, you have United Fruit, and they own all pretty much everything in Guatemala that's worth owning. They have the, they own the telephones. Uh, I believe they own the railroad lines, such as the, whatever there was there. Not a whole lot, but they own the only one that there was, and uh, they dominated the economy. And there was they had a whole lot of land that they weren't even using to um, grow anything on. Right. They just it was uncultivated land and Yacobo are and they also had landless peasants. So you have all this land that's not being used and you have this pe this peasantry that's pretty desperate and poor. Uh, Guatemala is there's a, a Guatemalan elite named Yacobo Arbenz. And he's a sort of liberal guy, kind of like, uh, you know, analogous to like a Kennedy or a Roosevelt in his own country. And he is elected because they have democratic elections and the, the promises land reform. And he wants to take the uncultivated land and compensate United Fruit Company for that and then disperse that land to landless peasants to deal with the social problems in his country. So it's really a case of eminent domain when it comes down to it. They weren't saying we're going to nationalize this outright and it's land that you're profiting from. It's basically like this is land and we're going to we have more important uses for this and we're going to compensate you for that. He wanted to compensate them uh, according to. United Fruit Company's own uh, estimates of what the land was worth for tax purposes. Now, for the United Fruit, they say, well, they eventually come out and say, essentially, well, we, those were ridiculously lowball estimates that we gave you so we wouldn't have to pay taxes. That's like their defense, <laughs> such as it was, right? So this is they're very unhappy about this, and they use, they're very connected. They have people on their board of directors that are at the highest positions in uh, the national establishment, like the Dulles brothers had both done work for them, um, Henry Cabot Lodge. All these scions of the American elite were, were connected to United Fruit, and so yeah, they had even, a lot of sway. Even Eisenhower's personal secretary was the wife of the publicity director. So just uh, everywhere through the government, Walter Bettel Smith, after this becomes the president of United Fruit, like they are, they are like synonymous with the U.S. government at, at, in this era. Yeah, because going back, this is uh, one of the main, this is one of the early um, areas where the U.S., where U.S. imperialism really asserted itself was in, especially in the early parts of the 20th century, uh, dominating the political economy of Latin America, especially Central America. And especially the fruit companies were more power. I mean, that's where the term banana republic comes from. It's a it's a country in Latin America where the fruit company is more powerful than the elected government. And it was a neo-colonialism. They'd gotten, uh, you know, independence from Spain, but they were totally dominated by uh, ex by international capitalists uh, centered in the United States. Yeah. And, and for context, I mean, this is still very relevant history for today. If you want to go back really briefly. So United Fruit eventually becomes Chiquita. And of course, people probably know Chiquita, you know, for their bananas. But uh, this is relevant for modern history. Eric Holder, who was Obama's attorney general, he in the 2000s represented Chiquita in a in a notorious case in which Chiquita was um, was found guilty of paying money to fascist death squads in Colombia that were involved in murdering union organizers and and ethnically cleansing indigenous peoples to steal their land. So the Democratic administration under Obama that you know promised hope and change appointed as its attorney general a guy who was representing a corporation that has this, again, United Fruit became Chiquita and that was directly giving money to fascist death squads in Colombia to steal land and kill labor organizers. <laughs> and this, these are the Democrats. I mean, obviously the Republicans do very similar things, but it's not that surprising when it's a Republican because they don't pretend to be progressive like the Democrats do. Right. I mean, this this it goes on to the present day. The 2009 coup in Honduras was a similar sort of a thing. Uh, and that was, Honduras was kind of the original banana republic. 
the guy in 20, I think it's 1912 or 13. Uh, Zalea was over, was, or no, that's why that was in Nicaragua, but there was a, the Honduran pr- government was overthrown by Sam Zamuri, um, back in the, uh, around this time. And they did a similar thing to a guy named Zalea in Nicaragua around this time period. And then in 2009, the guy in Honduras, they overthrow happens to be named Zalea. So it's a little confusing to keep all this straight, but the, the main current is, the, the guy that overthrew the government in Honduras, the original Banana Republic around the turn of the century, is also a key figure in United Fruit at this time in 1954. And the real start of this discussion begins not in Washington as far as the overthrow goes. It's, it begins in Council on Foreign Relations uh, circles. They're the ones saying, like, this is our Ben's guy's got to go. And they were similarly, they were like, that was like how it was with uh, Iran. Also, it was also something that began. We talked about this as a Seven Sisters program against uh, Iran, oil company uh, campaign against Iran. So this is corporate power that we see here. And anti-communism is the excuse. You just say that that these guys are communists if they're trying to do this, because only communists would want to nationalize land or, you know, impact the sanctity of private property. They must be communists. So they, they decide they eventually get. Uh, Eisenhower administration to a green light operation success for the CIA to get rid of Jacobo Arbenz. And this is, there's a mural here by Diego Rivera sort of depicting the, uh, the aftermath of that or sort of artistic uh, version of the coup and its effects. And you see there's a, the, in this, in this mural, you have John Foster Dulles depicted as a kind of snarling old man, shaking hands to a, the new sort of obsequious toady leader and he's uh, John Foster Dulles is holding a bomb with Eisenhower's face on it because this was a part of the U.S. nuclear brinksmanship foreign policy. Uh, we were the original country that was threatening to use nukes all the time. The U.S. threatened to nuke, uh, to drop the nukes on Russia in 1946 uh, in Iran. That was the first time that they used that as nuclear blackmail. I mean, explicitly, it was like, if you don't withdraw from Iran, we're going to drop the nuke on you. So the U.S. had plans for the nuclear bomb. And that's probably why they, it's, it's very likely that's why they dropped it on Japan ultimately was to show the Soviets that they had it and they were going to be running things after the war. So this 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 time period, the, the U.S. is perceived like this in the third world, but the American public doesn't have any idea of what's really going on. Um, one of the notorious things that comes out of this operation success in Guatemala is a CIA assassination manual. And With assassinations, the CIA typically is not forthcoming about the details of what they do. This is one of the rare things that's escaped about this over the years. And uh, this one is quite notorious. It it gives you a definition of assassination, and it's not a very long thing. You can sit down and read it. It's pretty short. Uh, And they go through... Uh, how, you know, the wh- how whether it's justified or not, what kind of person could actually carry out an assassination, how it needs to be planned. And uh, the a, a very telling passage here, they say the most efficient accident, because they think an accident is like best. If you can do it that way, it's like it looks like it's somebody else that did it or it was not an assassination. That's the best. They say the most efficient accident is a fall of 75 feet or more onto a hard surface. Elevator shafts, stairwells, windows, and bridges will serve. Um, and, uh, you know, you just tip the subject over the edge. Uh, sudden vigorous excise something. So they take something out. Uh, but but do give them a shove around the ankles, knock the su- topple them over the edge of something. And if the, if the person who pushes them sets up to, like, you know, scream. So you could basically push someone off a balcony or something and then go, oh, no, oh, no. Uh, then you're playing the horrified witness. You don't need an alibi, a surreptitious withdrawal or anything like that. And uh, so this is like very similar to things that we've seen happen. These falls from high places, like you can think of uh, Frank Olson, the Frank Olson case uh, that was this, with the CIA apparently threw this guy out of a window. If you've ever seen the film Wormwood. And more recently, James Le Monsieur, uh, I think that's the guy's name who runs the White Helmets, like he dies. Uh, right as the white helmets were coming under more and more scrutiny uh, because they were a British intelligence propaganda operation, basically. Um, the, the guy that founded them dies like that in Turkey somewhere. He gets pushed from a high point. 
So they, they, this, this manual is kind of the beginning of this, but I think it goes into another level of secrecy after this because we don't really have that many documents like this later on. So who knows what kind of advanced techniques they have now. I mean, the, uh, was that Michael Hastings uh, seems to have like had his car hacked and was killed that way. It looks, I mean, even Richard Clark says like, yeah, this is, this is a possibility. Um, so there's reasons to think that there's every reason to believe that they are much more sophisticated now. Uh, how did Hugo Chavez die uh, of cancer? You know, that's, uh, I think it was William Blum who said like, if the CIA wasn't trying to kill Chavez, they weren't doing their job. Uh, and that, that's one way to put it. But this manual, the 1954 one, this is this is like assassination 101 for the CIA, really. This is like the basics. They have a diagram of uh, conference rooms because sometimes people are having a conference and you got to kill them. So they have like diagrams of how the people should enter the room with like machine guns and shoot everyone. And this is just ways to kill people more efficiently and just carry out uh, the, the, the organize you see the, the mafia aspect and the government aspect are merging because of imperialism but oh communism this terrible threat it, it must justify everything so we've got to do this it's dirty business but it has to be done that's the logic that these people would employ to, to justify quote unquote this yeah and and all this history is so relevant still for today i mean in in terms of this this assassin assassination manual there was something very similar in the 1980s in the same region in Central America that was known as the CIA's murder manual. This was the CIA manual created to, uh, to train the Contras. In, and there's both a Spanish and an English language version, version. And the Washington Post actually published an excerpt from it in 1984. And the article in the Washington Post was titled The CIA's Murder Manual. It said the CIA manual advising Nicaraguan guerrillas how to kidnap, assassinate, blackmail, and dupe civilians is an appalling production, and its disclosure has produced a first-class storm. I mean, this shows that even though the Washington Post has always been an asset of intelligence agencies, it, it also shows how much it's how much worse it's gotten even since the 1980s. They used to report on some of this stuff. I mean, there's th this is a whole other like a uh, huge can of worms. There's so much stuff in here. The CIA murder manual referred to the war they were waging as a Christian and democratic crusade. They referred to it as a crusade, which obviously is pregnant with implications given the history of Spanish colonialism. They called for the, the CIA murder manual taught the Contras how to kill Nicaraguan government officials, judges security officers and Sandinista chiefs. They they told them to create martyrs, including through false flags they blamed on the government. And they encouraged them to lead the demonstrators, that is protesters, into a confrontation with authorities so as to provoke riots or shootings in order to destabilize the country. So this is a tactic we've seen again and again. We saw it in Hong Kong where one of the Hong Kong riot leaders wrote an article in the New York Times boasting. He said, the point is to get the police to hit you. So, I mean, there's this, this history in, in Nicaragua and Central America is so relevant to today. And you mentioned, I mean, Aaron, there are these historical echoes that are shocking. So in 2009, the U.S. government, the Obama administration oversaw a coup against the elected president not even a socialist, a left-leaning nationalist president, a liberal in uh, Honduras, Manuel Salaya. And that's exactly also what happened in 1909, exactly 100 years before against another Salaya in Nicaragua. And th that was Jose Santos Salaya, whereas in Honduras, it's Jose Manuel Salaya. And like Salaya in, in Honduras 100 years later, Jose Santos Alaya was not a socialist. He was a liberal. And, and his general, Benjamin Saledon, is still a, main, a major figure in Nicaragua. There are streets named after him. And there was a young fighter who fought in Benjamin Saledon's army, the liberal army, against the U.S.-backed conservatives and the U.S. military occupation. His name was Agosto Sanino. And then, of course, when the liberals eventually, in the 1930s, they signed a treaty with the U.S. colonial occupiers, and that's when Sandino creates his own guerrilla army. He he rebels against the liberals for 
being too conciliatory with the U.S. colonialists that were militarily occupying Nicaragua. But the point is that like this history, I mean, I don't want to get too much into it, but just like this is something that I, you know, as living in Nicaragua, this is something that like I've studied a lot. The parallels can't even they they can't be more direct. I mean, you literally have people with the same name 100 years later being overthrown basically for the same reasons. Right. I mean, it's not the parallels. There, It's like a straight line. Parallel is like two lines, but this is more of like a straight line. Right. I mean, this is it, it's the same thing. Haiti, part of the problem with um, the government in Honduras and you, this has happened with Haiti, too, is the minimum wage issue. Like they if governments want to raise the minimum wage in those countries, then that sets upward, puts upward pressure on the other countries because they are the floor of like sweatshop labor essentially in the region and for countries operating in the western hemisphere honduras and haiti represent the floor of like exploitable labor and so if they pass minimum wage laws so that people are making like i don't know a dollar an hour something exorbitant like that right then the u.s freaks out and wants to change that because then all the other sweatshops and other enterprises in other countries will charge you know 15 cents more uh, an hour yeah. or the workers will demand that much more yeah, so yeah. this is this just is the it's, same thing it's exploitation it's actually less than a dollar an hour in in the case of Haiti when they tried to raise it like I believe forty or fifty cents uh, to almost a dollar an hour if I remember correctly. So you're making about five dollars a day for context. And I believe uh, Levi's came back and was like, "Well, our, our jeans are going to be too expensive now <laughs> if we pay our workers even you know less than a dollar an hour." So they they you know after the the law passed, we came in and said, "No, actually, that's." That's not going to happen. And Ben just pulled this up. So I'll, I'll let you go ahead with it. So this article points out in, in Telesaur that workers in Haiti were trying to they were trying to increase the wage to five dollars a day, which was 61 cents per hour. But that was too high. So in 2008, when the Haitian parliament started discussing doubling or tripping the minimum, tripling the minimum wage to about from about one point seven five one 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 dollar and seventy five cents a day. The WikiLeaks cables show the U.S. embassy officials started monitoring the minimum wage. In 2009, lawmakers voted to more than double Haiti's minimum wage from about $1.75 a day to $3.75 a day. Uh, what is this too long here? Whatever. This we is, get the point. Th but you, with the when you see this in WikiLeaks, for example, and they put this out, this shows you a couple of things. Number one, it shows you that this the, the U.S., how what what liberal understanding of U.S. diplomacy and, and international law would entail U.S. State Department people being very concerned about the minimum wage of these countries, right? That is clearly something that, according to like international law, is in the purview of the countries themselves. So this is there's no other explanation for this except that that economic imperialism really is this huge driving factor of U.S. U, U.S. governance. Okay. And the other the other thing to keep in mind here is how much do does the government hate WikiLeaks for exposing this type of information? Okay, so the U.S. doesn't not only does the U.S. function as this kind of global sovereign, you know, a, a sort of global dictator uh, for the world, micromanaging their policies, on something as as banal as the minimum wage in a country, they're interested in that and and, and want to crush any efforts that aren't to their liking. But that they don't even want the world to know about this, these aspects of U.S. foreign policy. And if somebody is exposing that to the world, then they will want to kill that person. I mean, even if he's an Australian citizen, even if it makes now the U.S. Everybody knows that this is making the U.S. look totally gangsterish, and the U.S. still cares more about, you know, being creating this sort of mafia sense of fear among people that they're going to go after Assange, even though it's damaging to the actual image of the United States. This is. This is where things have changed in recent years. And this also goes back to what you were saying about how the Times and the Post used to report things. I think the liberal media, which has always functioned as an arm of the establishment, they used to report on things once they were no longer deniable. They would report on them if they were notable, noteworthy, just by virtue of the importance of the facts involved that had already been exposed. Like that used to be the way they handled some of these covert operations. Now it seems that we get absurd denials that that that, that don't even that, that don't withstand any scrutiny, but the media doesn't 
even apply that kind of scrutiny anymore. So when you wonder why people like don't trust the media, I think this is in a way a part of it is that they stopped even doing they even they stopped doing the job they used to do, which was to analyze and admit to things that were no longer deniable. Now they have gone further and basically deny or obfuscate things that are already out there if you know where to look. And it's it's a bit it's a scarier stage in a way because it's a more kind of overt like at least the the need to pretend to not be fascist made the media somewhat honest in the past and now that seems to be going away and we have absurdities that just sit out there in the public record like the Ep like what happened with Epstein like the coup in Maidan in 2014 that's that's omitted from all these conversations like that got exposed pretty badly and yet we're just like no the this was a people's revolution and ukraine is a sovereign country like ukraine is not a sovereign country they were a regime installed by the us and it's obvious but people in you know a lot of people on the semi left can't because the they take their cues in a way from the new york times and so on they have to treat it as like oh this is unconfirmed or oh this is what some people say and maybe they did who knows but this is debatable when really it's out there and we should it should be a part of the discussion but it's not and this is just sort of top down top down power in action and that what it's evolved to in the US which is scary so on the Haiti thing, um, you brought up economic imperialism. We talked about global labor arbitrage back in the imperialism episode. So the idea that capital can move in and out as it pleases versus people can't. And so you have wage differentials. And so when they try to, you know, like you said, double the minimum wage from 24 cents to 61 cents, uh, the U.S. Embassy, a guy named David Lindwall at the U.S. Embassy said that the minimum wage, quote, did not take economic reality into account. And so the economic reality of, of U.S. empire is that people can not make five dollars a day when it costs twelve dollars a day to have a family of four. So it, it's not it's not a quote unquote livable wage, whatever that would even mean at, at twelve dollars a day. Um, you know, it, it just like that. That is in a way they're right, because the economic reality is under global labor arbitrage that if you had raised the minimum wage, like you said, on the, the wage floor, then you would just move all the capital off to Honduras and you could, you know, you can just hop around to whoever will have the most lax labor laws, the most, you know, terrible working conditions and the lowest minimum wage. And that is where, you know, like they'll, they'll race to the bottom for that reason. But to your point about the, the media, I, I mean, if you looping back to, cause I, I want to talk a little bit more about Guatemala because that's such a, you know, this, this becomes sort of a playbook for the way that the U.S. does it ever since, really, and, and at least uh, their methodology until they could do it by more surreptitious means, like you were saying. Um, it, you know, if you look at the media reaction, anytime that anyone would say, hey, the U.S. was involved here, it would be called communist propaganda, just right, right off the bat. But if you were to say something like, and I'll just, you know, throw out a quote here, the coup wouldn't have worked if the Hondurans hadn't let us take off planes to bomb Guatemala, you'd be called a conspiracy theorist. Well, why would, you know, why would we be bombing Guatemala and why would we have planes in Honduras? But that's a quote from Alan Dulles. So at, at a certain point, like <laughs> you said, uh, you, you can make it public. You can say it after the fact, like you said, once it's, once it can fully come out in the open, the CIA's own website can talk about Air America because those things can, can be published after the fact once enough time goes by. But at the time, you're going to be called crazy. You're going to be called a conspiracy theorist, even if you're just saying things like the, the CIA director would say. But at, at the same time, I, and, and just to point out, because we didn't really go through what happened in Guatemala, and the methodology that we took becomes sort of a guide and a guide for uh, opponents of U.S. empire. A, a young Che Guevara is in Guatemala City when, when the, the Castillo Armas coup happens. And so um, you know, they take away an understanding that goes to the Bay of Pigs that they know exactly what is going to come for them because they've seen them try it before. And the assumption is that it's going to continue to work the way that it did. But essentially, the U.S. does take off planes from Honduras, bombs Guatemala and tells a bunch of the generals, if you don't back the coup, then the U.S. is going to invade. And so they're sort of able to launch like a, a psychological warfare operation as well to scare the population, to scare specifically Yakovo Arbenz into thinking that the U.S. is like already marching down or has a has like a, a right wing army marching down. And so he just resigns outright. And and there was a push on the left to, to fight back. But it, this is a hugely successful psychological operation. 
And in the years beforehand, and I'm sorry, I could keep going on all day about Guatemala, but the, in the years beforehand, the, the original operation was not PB success, it was PB fortune. And General James Doolittle, who was an old friend of, of, of course, General Dwight Eisenhower, then president, uh, said that the CIA needed to operate viciously and, quote, there are no rules in such a game. Hitherto acceptable norms of human contact do not, sorry, human conduct do not apply. So that, you know, that there's sort of this, all bets are off. There are no rules on the table. Uh, um, ideology here that they can do what they need to do. But then again, in, in 1968, and I don't want to jump too far ahead, um, but the State Department has a memo where they say uh, that the, the violence in Guatemala presents a, quote, serious problem for the U.S. in terms of our image in Latin America and for the credibility of what we say we stand for. And so that there's sort of an understanding that that the optics matter, like we have to not look fully imperialist, like you're saying, right? maybe the wheels have come off the bus there and we, we don't really care what we look like anymore. But at the time, there's an understanding that there's a gap between reality and what we say we stand for. And, uh, and as a direct result of this coup, six years later, the Bay of Pigs gets, uh, you know, a lot of the training for the Cubans for the Bay of Pigs happens in Guatemala and ends up destabilizing the country, leading to a civil war, which leads to two or 300,000 people dead as a direct result of death squads. And then, of course, Rios Montt, the, uh, the general who uh, launched the coup in 1982, says, uh, as you know, kind of a play on the Mao quote, the, the gorilla must move among, amongst the people as a fish swims in the sea. Rios Montt says, if you cannot catch the fish, you have to drain the sea. And uh, uh, essentially goes about genociding the indigenous population of Guatemala. And that has led to starvation. And, uh, and of course, like uh, everyone likes to talk about the immigration issue from there, that is a direct result of the starvation and the, the impoverishment of the people that uh, it comes straight from the 1954 coup. And so it, it's, a, it's obviously a massive success from our perspective, which makes you obviously, you know, I think every viewer knows that the U.S.'s idea of success is maybe not so great for anybody else around there, but um, but but it's important to understand the way that we went about it because that becomes such a sort of like an, uh, Peter Del Scott would say like a negative template. It's a way to also understand how do you run counter to it because this is sort of the way that the CIA starts to learn how to go about this. Iran, they're still getting it down a little bit. Guatemala is a raging success, but then it also fails in the Bay of Pigs. So it, it's this constant play between insurgency and counterinsurgency in this era. And that is what defines the sort of Eisenhower era of, of third world operations. So I, I just wanted to kind of give some background there because you have, you know, this gets used again and again. United Fruit is paying Castillo Armas $20,000 a month as a retainer to keep him ready for when they're finally going to launch the coup. And they learn from this that you need to keep people in your pocket and you need to have the media on board. You launch a domestic you know, media operation. All of this is a great way to understand the template for what, what is going to happen again in like we're going to talk about in, in Indonesia and elsewhere. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of give some background there because we're, we're touching on a lot, a lot of things that grow out of Guatemala, including the murder manual. Uh, so much of this starts here. Um, but but next up comes the conflict in Indochina that, that becomes Vietnam with the French uh, and them trying to reclaim their colonial territory post-World War II. Um, and, and that was going on as Eisenhower took office. So uh, turning away from, from Guatemala and now over to Asia, how did the Eisenhower administration handle the, uh, the French Indochina war? Well, they inherited this situation from... Uh, the Harry Truman administration. And at that time, if you look at a map of French Indochina, it was all of those those four countries now, or well, three countries now, but it, you have uh, Laos and Cambodia and then different regions of what became Vietnam. Uh, and they were, they had finally been able to, I mean, they'd been fighting the French for since the end of World War II. Ho Chi Minh went to Versailles to ask Woodrow Wilson to uh, to speak about the, the the plans for Vietnam after World War One, you know, because because Woodrow Wilson was there talking about self determination, making the world safe for democracy. So Ho Chi Minh rents a a, a bowler hat and a tuxedo or whatever, and goes to try to meet Woodrow Wilson, and he's not he's turned back. 
So after World War II, in World War uh, II, he had been resisting the Japanese uh, and the 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 Viet, the Viet Minh, the Vietnamese nationalists. They were uh, working with the OSS, even if you can believe that, because they were part of the anti-Japanese resistance there. And so after the war, he asks Truman if they could have their independence, and Truman again rebuffs them. So this this is the trend of the U.S. not being the champion of uh, colonized peoples, not standing up, not sticking up for what they actually profess, self-determination and so on, anti-imperialism, because the U.S. is born of, an, of a supposedly anti-imperialist struggle, which is more complicated, we know, but the U.S. is supposed to be against colonialism, supposed to be against imperialism, uh, and supposed to be for self-determination. They're not in this case. And so the, the, the people in Vietnam, people in French Indochina have to win their independence, and they do, in a, in a war. And this is uh, decisive in 1954. The U.S. is basically paying for the entire French war. So the war effort is more than the, the France could possibly pay because they don't want uh, to lose the Western domination of this region of the world. They're actually backing the French. Uh, and they want, they also want the French to be supportive of like NATO and other U.S. ventures. So for a number of reasons, the U.S. is actually financing French colonialism and a French colonial war. And this all comes to a head at Dien Bien Phu, this decisive battle in 1954. Um, the French foolishly dig into a remote position, a valley that's surrounded by all of these mountains in Vietnam. And the Vietnamese perform one of the great uh, feats. I think this, I don't know, if, there's no perfect analogy here. But it's sort of like the long march in 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 uh, in Chinese history. You could say maybe this is a little bit of a Vietnamese version of it. You could call it the great the great schlep or something like that, right? Because that they wouldn't have used that word. But they have monuments to this in Vietnam. The the French uh, the Viet Minh lugged these enormous rush uh, artillery pieces that the Soviets had given them up into the mountains, and they were just shelling the French. Uh, endlessly from these positions and the French morale collapses and it would have been horrifying uh, for the French. The, the Vietnamese were led by No Dinh Giap, the guy who eventually also defeats the, the U.S. in Vietnam. And this is uh, the end of the, of, the, of the French empire in Southeast Asia. Now, as this is happening in the U.S. side under Eisenhower, you have this, the proposed Operation Vulture, which was they were going to give nukes to the French in order to drop them, to try to drop them on the Vietnamese positions. And the French uh, eventually, and Alan or John Foster Dulles was for this. Eisenhower eventually decides, no, I'm not going to do this. But they wanted a whole air armada in the U.S. to intervene overtly. And this was a huge plan. The Brits actually were saying, no, this is too much. You can't be nuking these people. So the, the Brits had been doing this for a long time and they were kind of racist, but they also had a more realistic perception of how they didn't want, they needed to not emphasize that too much. And that having these white colonial people drop bomb, drop more bombs because they'd already nuked some defenseless Asians in Japan. And if you were going to drop this on some other people across the Pacific ocean, I mean, how can the U S not seem like a really brutal empire? So the Brits kind of sense this, uh, Dulles eventually offers the nukes to France and says, well, well you could do it yourself. And they, France, the French didn't want this. They said, well, this is too much. And we don't even know how we could do this without nuking our own people. And that would be hard to explain. So it never happens in the French surrender. Uh, and that's the end of the war. But this is notable for anyone who talks about uh, the nuclear war today, the, the U.S. position on nukes. Like they actually, it was lucky that the U.S., the leadership decided not to use them here um, because this was something that was on the table for them. Yeah, Aaron, this history is very important because oftentimes when in the United States, when we learn about the history of the Vietnam War, this pre-war history, at least pre-U.S. war history, is often erased, the history of the National Liberation War, French colonialism. But the U.S. was deeply involved. You talk about how the U.S. was financing the, the French war efforts and also the U.S. was involved in helping to shape the settlement. So what was the U.S. role in, in, in influencing the settlement? Well, you're probably not going to have a hard time believing this, but the U.S. role was nefarious and harmful. 
Um, they did not work to create a just outcome. After the war is concluded, the parties meet in Geneva from April to July of 1954. And July 21, they issue, uh, you know, the, the, these, the, the conclusions for the Geneva agreements, right? And they establish that Vietnam will be divided between the North and the South uh, along the 17th parallel. There's going to be a DMZ on each side of this border. There's going to be French Union forces in the South and then Viet Minh forces in the North. Uh, and and all, additionally, there's going to be free movement between the North and the South for 300 days. Uh, neither of the sides could join a military alliance or seek military aid from outside parties. And an international control commission was established, including Canada, Poland, and India, to monitor the peace. This, by way of, you know, pretty interesting historical accident, this is how Peter Dell Scott was able to have access to all of these reports on Indonesia and La or sorry on Vietnam and Laos uh, because he was working as a Canadian diplomat uh, toward with Poland and so Canada and Poland are both on this control commission and so Peter strange accident of fate as a diplomat had access to much of what was going on in Vietnam at this time or in, you know in Southeast Asia and former Indochina uh, in this whole area. The, and now the key provision of the, of the Geneva uh, Accords were that there were to be free, general, free and fair general elections across both territories by secret ballot in July of 1956 that would be overseen by this International Control Commission. And this would have re this was the plan to unify the country. The U.S. never signed this onto this agreement, and then you can see why because they actually had no intention of honoring it. So eventually you get in the U.S. in 1956, they scuttle these elections. They decide not to allow these elections to happen. And as the Pentagon Papers revealed, when Daniel Ellsberg leaked the Pentagon Papers, one of the revelations was that U.S. officials had estimated that if elections had been held, it, Ho Chi Minh would have won over 80 percent of the vote. And so what does the U.S. champion of democracy do in that situation? Well, then they just don't have the elections. They don't let the Vietnamese vote. And their own puppet, No Din Diem, who's this Catholic who was handpicked by Edward Lansdale, is installed as the puppet leader in South Vietnam. Lansdale had played a similar role in the Philippines years earlier, uh, putting U.S. puppet Ramon Magsaysay into power. And so No Din Diem was, you know, something they thought would be along, function along similar lines in the South. And this uh, is... You, the way that this is depicted in the in the West uh, is I always like these Time Magazine covers because, you know, Time Magazine is published by the guy who wrote the American Century, C Council on Foreign Relations member Henry Luce. Right. So this is really like the, the free press in the United States. But it's really like you could say it's like the deep state press. Right. I mean, it's really Wall Street, corporate power, anti-democratic, one in global imperium and lots of money to be made uh, around the world. And so Time Magazine is like presenting the world to advance that general agenda. And there was a Ho Chi Minh was on one cover and it is kind of like the original Dark Brandon uh, aesthetic. I think <laughs> he's like shrouded in red with darkness in the background. And so this is like clearly meant to convey. Dark you know, Ho. So, yeah, Dark Ho, Dark Uncle Ho, let's call him. Uh, and then there's a, another cover with No Din Diem, the puppet, and he is in this nice white suit and there's flowers in the background and there's a flag, but there's a little bit of redness and darkness and the flag of a unified Vietnam is torn in half with a communist sickle, okay? So it's basically an art, a very crude high school art student kind of way of saying like, it's mm. the communists that are responsible for Vietnam being unified which is 100% false uh, propaganda uh, in order for, to advance U.S. imperialism. I, I don't really for being, see For how. being divided. Right. I mean, this is the reason why Vietnam is not able to unify is because of the U.S. and they refused to go along with these uh, elections and instead installed this puppet. Time magazine wants to present the exact opposite argument because uh, if the truth is inconvenient, you can just use the mass media to lie about it and you know what are people going to believe so this is you, you can see how you, you can see these uh sort of foreshadowing elements in, in terms of the way things went in vietnam and why they went the way that they did 
Um, after the, we talked about how there was a 300 day period in Vietnam uh, for people to move freely between the places. And the US, I be, the way to interpret this whole fiasco here is that the US likely realized that their puppet guy, this Catholic fellow, had no real base of support in the South. And there was a Catholic population in the North and they, they, in their own harebrained way, they thought that perhaps this could be a base for uh, Ho Chi, for No Dinh Diem to have some kind of popular anti-communist support because these people were Catholic. Anti-communists had often been collaborators with the French. So they have this Operation Passage to Freedom run by Edward Lansdale, who was a, a Alan Dulles protege, notorious CIA operative who also had military high military rank, a colonel and then later general. They launch Operation Passage to Freedom, and that involves moving uh, over 300,000, probably half a million to a million uh, North Vietnamese to the South. A lot of them were Catholics, like No Dinh Diem. And these are uh, people who were often frightened into coming. So it, some of them would have wanted to go perhaps down there, given the, the chance left to their own devices, because they would have a more friendly government down there than the, um, the, the Viet Minh one. But uh, they also used a psychological warfare campaign to terrify everyone. Uh, posters saying, go south to avoid communism. People of southern Vietnam are welcoming people with open arms, uh, the people in North Vietnam. And they also even used threats of nuclear bombs. They said that the Soviets are likely to bomb the north. And if you want to survive, you better go to the south. So they were terrifying these, these people who had been colonial subjects for a long time with uh, the idea that the communists were going to nuke them and they might just get blown up. So you had, they had every reason to want to go to the South if they could. This causes all sorts of problems in the South. They have to absorb all of these refugees and they're not a very affluent society anyway, obviously. And the No Den Diem regime treats them as a kind of special interest group or privileged group. And there's, you know, there, there's, it's difficult to have the, you know, land available for these kind of people, for these sort of settlers and so on. And the majority is Buddhist, but the DM sees uh, Buddhism as more of an association rather than a religion. He doesn't even treat it as a, as a religion. And so they oppress the Buddhists and treat them very badly. This ultimately leads under Kennedy, you know, a few years later to the Buddhist crisis where you had people self-immolating uh, Buddhist monks and so on. These, these images appeared in U.S. magazines. So the, the seeds were set for what Kennedy and then Johnson had to deal with in Vietnam uh, by Truman for not recognizing the, the independence of the Vietnamese, but also uh, by Eisenhower. It's, it's exacerbated under Eisenhower. I mean, I think it's hard to say for sure, but I think Truman would have not necessarily... Truman, by his reluctance to approve Operation Ajax in Iran, for example, he may have not gone the same route on Vietnam. Uh, it's hard to say because it, oftentimes Truman did on in the most important cases break with the um, on the side of the Wall Street people that kind of put him in power in the first place. But there were little differences here and that might have been one where Truman would have done something different, but it didn't matter because under Eisenhower, you're getting the Council on Foreign Relations foreign policy uh, as executed by people like Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles. And so you have this awful situation in uh, Vietnam that Kennedy in, inherits, and uh, but, but really Eisenhower and Dulles uh, did very mischievous work here. Well, what we're going to do here is we're actually going to end this episode because we're already at around an hour and we wanted to also talk about Indonesia in this episode, but we try to keep these episodes somewhat shorter to not be, you know, five hours long. And the U.S. dirty operations in Indonesia, I mean, are just so nefarious that history is very important to understand Vietnam. It's very important to understand imperialism and the world we live in today. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Indonesia in the next part. So this was the end of part 15. As I said at the beginning of the episode, you don't need to listen or watch, listen to or watch these episodes in chronological order. Only if you, I mean, you can check out each episode separately and you'll understand for the most part. But if you want to go chronologically in part 16, the upcoming part, we're going to be talking about Indonesia. Today we discussed Guatemala and Vietnam. Of course, Vietnam is going to come back later as we go chronologically through the history of the U.S. empire and deep state.
I'm Ben Norton of Multipolarista, and I'm co-producing this podcast, the or the series, The Empire and Deep State, with the American Exception podcast. And Aaron Good is the host of American Exception and the author of the book, American Exception, Empire and the Deep State, that the series is based on. And Seamus McGinnis is the producer. You can support their podcast over at patreon.com slash American Exception. And we'll see you all next time. Thanks a lot.